and it's the first working day in the month of April, as well as the second quarter of 2024. Whatever we do today is gonna to count at the end of this quarter. So let's start doing good business on Business Incorporated. 55 minutes of going around the world of business is what we're doing today. And here's what we have for you for today. Will there be electricity tariff hike in Nigeria? Well, we'll find out in the course of this program. Not a good one for South Africa as we see that investment portfolio dropped in the final quarter of 2023. And in Kenya, there's now the approval for importation of electricity for resale. Welcome to the program. I'm Ini John Mekwa, and this is Business Incorporated. We start as usual at the global space. Oil prices rose on Tuesday, underpinned by signs that demand may improve as China and US are the world's biggest oil consumers. Uh, we see growing demands right there, but there are concerns of a widening conflict in the Middle East that could affect supply from the region. Brent features for June delivery rose 41 cents to $87.83 a barrel, while U.S. West Texas Intermediate Crude uh, for May was also up 41 cents to $84.12 a barrel after reaching its highest close since October 27th in the previous session. Manufacturing activity in March for China expanded for the first time in six months, and in the United States for the first time, in one and a half years, which should translate to rising oil demand this year. China is the world's largest crude importer and second largest consumer, while the U.S. is the biggest consumer. OPEC Plus is going to meet tomorrow on an online meeting of its Joint Ministerial Monitoring Committee to review the market and members' implementation of output cuts. Members are expected to uphold their current supply policy, calling for voluntary output cut of 2.2 million barrels every day to the end of the second quarter. OPEC's output fell last month by 50,000 barrels per day, indicating the voluntary cuts are having some effects. Higher discipline in production cuts from OPEC Plus members are being felt on the ground. And the market is also factoring in larger production cuts from Russia in the next three months. In the metals market now, gold prices rose to a fresh record high on Tuesday, still continuing this rally as demand from momentum flow following funds offset a strong US dollar and the possibility of higher for longer US rates. Spot gold rolls are 0.5% to $2,260. Uh, per ounce after hitting an all-time high of $2,266.59. The bullion has been hitting fresh record highs for three sessions in a row. The bullion rose by 9.3% in March, which was its biggest monthly growth since July 2020. It kept rising on Tuesday despite a strong U.S. dollar after Monday's data showed U.S. manufacturing grew but for the first time in a year and a half in March. Traders paired bets of a June interest rate cuts to 62% after the data. And amid high prices, European physical investors are selling mental wholesome back to their dealers, as well as Indian demand, which has been created. We come to Nigeria now. Electricity distribution companies in the country generated a total of 294.95 billion naira in the fourth quarter of last year, 2023. That's according to the latest report from the National Bureau of Statistics. In its latest report on electricity for the fourth quarter of 2023, the NBS said that the revenue generated by the discos rose by 26.96% year on year. That's compared to 232.32 billion naira recorded in the fourth quarter of 2022, while the total number of customers in the fourth quarter of 2023 rose by 3.46% to 12.12 million. That's up 11.71 million in the third quarter of the previous year. At the same time, the statistics office says 
The number of metered customers stood at 5.61 million in the fourth quarter of 2023, indicating a decrease in the growth rate of 1.32% from 5.68 million recorded in the preceding quarter, but grew by 9.38% year on year from the 5.13 million reported in the fourth quarter of 2022. And still related to that now, the Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority has released the domestic base price, an applicable wholesome price of natural gas for the strategic sectors. According to the Authority Chief Executive Engineer Farouk Ahmed, the domestic base price is pegged at $2.42 per million British thermal units. The authority states that this is in line with Section 167, the third and fourth shadow of PIA 2021, which mandates the NMD PRA to determine domestic base price and the market wholesale price of natural gas supplied to strategic sectors. Authority maintained that the new domestic base price was arrived at after due consultation with key stakeholders and taking into cognizance the provisions of the PIA as well as the gasseted gas pricing and domestic demand regulations. And you say, how does that concern me? Well, I'm sure by now you have already seen all over social media and other medium. They're talking about the impact this will have to electricity supply and most importantly to electricity pricing. Well, let's talk about that now with the spokesperson of the discos that the distribution companies uh, of the country, Mr. Sunday Odunto Abegapad Barrister. Sunday Odunto Barrister, good afternoon and thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Yeah, so um, there's the talk of possible electricity tariff hike because of the repricing uh, we've seen in the gas. Obviously, gas is what uh, you know, uh, they use for the generation of electricity. Please paint the picture for us. What's going on? What can we expect? Well, um, the issue of whether or not there will be an increase in tariff, electricity tariff, is still in the realm of speculation. However, I can say for a fact that you have to, uh, we all have to consider the economic indices, the reality that we have on the ground. And of course, that is what will determine whether or not there will be a need for an adjustment of the tariff, whether it's going to be downward or upward. Again, that's the job for the regulator and our regulator are doing their best to ensure that things are done properly and we don't put Nigerians in a more difficult situation. However, there is always a need for cost recovery. We cannot do a business without considering the cost of doing that business. So for now, I can say uh, there is no such an announcement yet from those who have the legal mandate to do that, which is the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission. Any other media reports to the effect of that is just in the realm of speculation. Thank you. All right, but help us to understand some of the implications of uh, the change in the base uh, price to $2.42 per million British terminal. W what does it mean? What does it translate to? Okay, what it means is that when you're talking about um, cost of production of any product, the moment any of your raw materials, the moment the cost of it go up, it will increase your cost of production, and that may increase the price of the product. Uh, in the case of the Nigerian electricity supply industry, uh, we produce electricity in Nigeria through two major areas, which is the use of gas and water. The water is the hydroelectric power plant. We have three of that that are currently uh, on stream. Others are coming. We have Kanji, we have Jeba, and we have Shiro. Those three are in Niger State. Apart from those three, all other power plants that are currently working use gas. They are gas-fired thermal plants. As a result of that, gas is a very essential raw material. And because of that, the cost of gas, of course, 
has an impact on the cost of electricity because this is part of what I call the raw materials, the essential raw material that is required to produce electricity. So that's what we have. So until we get to that point, nobody can say for sure what will happen. That's the truth. All right, just before that uh, gas story, we did uh, see statistics from discos. And I see you guys are making quite a lot of money, I must say. Uh, the discos generated a total of 294.95 billion. And yet we see the growth rate of metering customers reducing. Uh, what's going on with the, with the meters? We have maps and, and some other programs and attempts. Okay, thank you very much. When you see what looks like humongous uh, income, as you call it, uh, it is because people don't understand what we are talking about. People are looking at the volume. Let me give you an example. A particular disco. You know, disco, we are distribution companies. We buy electricity to sell to Nigerians. We distribute that electricity that is produced. And we're a collection agent. When we collect money from you, that money goes upstream to service, uh, to pay for the uh, generation company, they have to pay for the production of electricity. They also have to pay the gas suppliers. We have to pay the transporter of electricity, which is the uh, transmission company of Nigeria. We have to, that there, there are some loans that are being repaid back to Central Bank and some other stakeholders. Now, a particular disco, I'll give you an example of one of the discos, uh, their energy, the energy they received, the energy they purchased was about 12 billion naira for the month, that was two months ago, and they, they were able to collect 8 billion. When you hear 8 billion, you hear a lot of money. You say, ah, that's a lot of money, they're making money. But you should remember they're in, they in debt up to, of, up to at least 4 billion. That month. And from that statistics, where you see that our revenue has increased, what it speaks about is speak to our collection efficiency. It speaks to the fact that the discos have improved in the way they try their best against all odds to collect uh, from customers, to also block loopholes, to also cash energy tips to also try and bring into Dragnet more people. That's why you see an increment in the number of customers from the taxis you read earlier on. So all of these are uh, talked and speak to the issue of improvement in service. But it does not mean that we are making profit yet. In fact, we are not able to recover all our costs yet. We are trying our best to make it better but we're still not there yet. Um, if you look at a disco like Benin Electricity Software Division Company, if you check BEDC, in the last uh, 12 months, you will see quite a lot of improvement in everything, collection, the collection efficiency, ability to reduce losses and all of those things. These are about improvement. That's what we want people to understand. We want our government, we want regulators and people to understand that where there are improvements, we should encourage those who are doing their best to improve on the service. We should not, we should not stop or impede a winning team. What we should try to do is to encourage them and find every possible means to ensure that the power sector, uh, things improve, generally in the power sector. So when you see that money in it, we're not making those billions and we're not pocketing those billions. We're using to not only service debt, we have to pay the gas suppliers. We have to uh, ensure that every stakeholder gets what is due to them. As of today, no disco is able to remit 100% back, to, uh, back upstream. But we have improved so much that I can tell you that we are better today than we were 10 years ago. So that's, that's all I can say on that. Mm, and we hear that some government agencies and parastatals are still owing the discos. Do you have a plan? That's correct. Do you have a that plan for that? Well, uh, I want to commend 
the president of Nigeria, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, who broke the genes of ensuring that the presidential villa in Abuja are now paying their bill or paying their debt. So we want all ministry, departments, and agencies to copy the presidential, the Ashura villa. If the agencies pay their debts, they pay their bill, the issue of liquidity crisis that we have will be reduced. So it's a question of everyone playing their part. You see, it is about, it's about time that they begin to play their part. And I also want to thank the government for coming with the initiative of metering the military installation, beginning with the uh, Ikeja cantonment. So if you give them meters, they can make money, they can also be able to uh, measure their consumption and then pay as you go in the case of the paid meter. Then you, earlier you mentioned the issue of metering gap. Yes, it is true that the gap is still wide, uh, part of the problem for that is still a question of liquidity, cost, because the meter manufacturers or meter suppliers, all that they are doing come at a cost. And there's a foreign or foreign, uh, foreign exchange component to it. Because some of the uh, components that they use in manufacturing meters are imported. You can't get everything from Nigeria to manufacture a meter. And the, the fluctuation, the foreign exchange, and all other things, as are now, including the rate of inflation, uh, the exchange rate, and all those things, combine together to make the cost of meter go up. That's what is impeding what will have been a speedy uh, effort at metering uh uh, Nigeria. So I just want our people to be patient. I believe that government is working on it and it is in our interest as this goes for every of our customer to be metered. When you are metered, I can measure your consumption. When you are metered, I can be sure that everything will be working well. Uh, I'll be able to recover my costs. And when you are not metered, uh, you'll be wasting electricity. There will be a lot of leakages. Energy theft is a major problem. And in fact, the greatest problem that we are, the greater challenge we are facing today is energy theft. And with the energy theft, or less than until we are able to uh, reduce this significantly or stamp it out completely, I think we'll continue to be in debt. So when you hear of uh, billions of naira being collected, that's a kudos to the discos for an improvement in their collection efficiency. Kudos to the regulator for doing their job. Kudos to the government for encouraging us. We should all work together. What we need in Nigeria is collaboration. We need to work together and ensure that we deliver a very sustainable power sector. And that's, of course, what I believe both the current government, the generation companies, the transmission company of Nigeria, and the different companies, that's what we're all doing together. We're working together nowadays more than ever before. That's mm. his point. All right. Thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Mr. Barrister Sunday Oduton, a spokesperson of Discourse. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. All right. Let's take a break now. When we come back, we'll head to the markets and other segments of the program. Please stay with us. <music> Welcome back. Still business and corporate. We'll head to the markets now. Uh, with Will Ebon. Will, it's the first trading day of the quarter of the month. Mm -hmm. So we're expectant. Very expectant because at intraday, we was already seeing those equities were on holiday coming back with green Is numbers. Is it the equities that were on holiday or the investors? Oh, well, the <laughs> investors, and, well, the investors, I'm sure, were itching to buy, oh, but, you know, the, the market has to just take a break. Open. Has to take a break, you know, so they come back fresh, and let's see, Renewed. maybe they have... Renewed. That's if they haven't finished their funds, uh, you know, <laughs> you for, know, the, over the, for years, the holiday. Please? No, no, no. Of course, they'll be waiting to put in some money, and we see that already happening because investors are buying, not selling. Oh, so we're going to be looking at nice. that at intraday. So, trading uh, began with major equities in Africa, 
bullish, mostly bullish sentiments. We see Nigeria's NGX opening the first trading day after the Easter holiday in positive territory at intraday. It was up 0.19%. South Africa also resuming from that Easter holiday up in green territory, 0.25%. Elsewhere, though, Egypt's EGX 30 is down 0.31%, losing that 29,000 level. Also, Kenya closed last Thursday's session in the red. It's still yet to resume session, and we're going to wait to see its numbers first trading in the second quarter much later in the day. Now, let's dig into intra numbers at in intraday at the NGX with Abdul Rashid Momo. is the equity trader, TLW Stockbrokers. Good afternoon, Abdul Rashid. It's good to have you on the program. Good afternoon, Will. How are you? Fine, very fine. It's first trading day after Easter. Markets are looking good. What's driving that? Uh, well, let's let's first celebrate um, month of March because March actually made this happen. You know, we've been on a long rally since November. Um, that of then we had some rallies in um, February. The February actually took out a lot of momentum and March uh, took us back to where we are today. So we can thank March for a very good recovery. Um, the index so far, it's on the uptrend um, as we speak. We are up by 0.10%. That was 102.21. Most of the indexes are actually in green as we speak. Um, the most profitable ones so far, the most um, profitable ones so far are the banking sectors, I guess, based on their earning seasons around the corner. Um, the most traded so far, it's um, Access. Uh, by for 3 million units traded so far. Kitco, 38 million. Zenit, 37 million. UBA, 35. And full by Transco. So, so far, the market looks good. But most, most interesting are the banking sectors are where we see investors. Definitely. I've seen that Stambik, IBTC, and also Fidelity Bank are also in that winning team for intraday trades. Uh, investors are really, yeah. you know, eyeing those banking stocks. I did think that the news of the recapitalization in terms of, you know, banks not making use of the shareholders' funds as part of their share capital calculation was going to dampen investor sentiment. But we're seeing investors not backing down there and really going for those banking stocks. But we're just looking at earnings. They're coming in, and uh, one of Nigeria's oldest cocoa companies FT and Cocoa Processes, in its audited financial report for 2023, recorded zero earnings for the period. And the report showed that the firm suffered a 100% decline uh, compared to 62.1 million that it earned in 2022. Uh, what would you say, the company we know has been, you know, incurring losses, is in debt, and it says it has not been producing due to inadequate working capital. Uh, we understand the economic headwinds in the country, uh, but what is, is the country, I mean, the company facing bankruptcy? Is that what we are seeing? I think there was injection of funds by a new investor, I think, two years ago. Um, I think we are still within, within the gestation period. Uh, for you, we've not seen the true light of what's happening. But so far, what we know is that, the, as we said, the company has been producing below capacity of about 5% due to, as you said, um, working capital inadequacy. And this has impacted um, in the, on the gross margin as a result of huge fixed costs that has, that has to be borne. Well, funny enough, um, the, brand, the sector in which they are in, number one, agriculture, number two, cocoa is a strong brand. And number three, despite the information on FTN Cocoa, the, despite the negative information on FTN Cocoa, as we speak, the stock is we have more investors actually trading that stock as we speak. We have over 6 million buyers and about 2.7 million um, units. So we can see that there's still strength in the stock. You know, as we normally say, um, when such information come out, it's it's sometimes it can create an avenue for for people that needs the boss to actually go into the stock. Um, from what from the information that that came that came out, we expected FTN Coco to be on the downside. But as we speak, uh, there are still people are buying into 
witness. So for me, I think it's um, you need to take you need to take your time. It's going to be a long long term stock. I think um, it's not one thing investors should just go ahead and sell off now. I think it's a hold from okay. what I'm seeing now. Okay, as we speak now, some people have just they just sold down, but I definitely um they just sold down as we speak now. They sold out about one naira fifty three cover. But overall bid still remains on the high side, about five million as against uh, two point one million. Oh, that's so we watch and see how everything goes. Uh, fantastic! It's actually but for short term. For it's... short term, is not too interesting, but okay. for long term, um, Coco is a very strong brand and it's doing well in the market. So, international market. Yeah, especially now uh, that Coco has been rallying this year, we do want to see that uptick for F FTN Coco processors. We know that in the first uh, six months of 2023, it gained about seven hundred twenty seven hundred twenty two percent and that's in price appreciation the price moved from 0 0.2 now that's 29 cobble uh recorded yes. on 30th of december 2022 to 2 naira 39 cobble as a 30th of june 2023 uh so the, well, the, the stock has been doing so well so i'm surprised they the say they're not been producing we actually went to four naira about four naira from 25 cobble you went to four naira so it's actually oscillating within a fixed pre, uh, range of about, uh, give or take 135 to about 189. That's the price range for for now. So what what for us in TA, what we'll be looking at for, we're looking at support levels of about um, 138 cover or so. If there's a breakdown to us that then we know that, uh, and we are, we are going to see in the beginning of, um, lower i mean lower lows but i think that support level is likely going to hold okay for ftn okay yeah. so just quick one market is going to be green or red just one word i just want to close with that at the end of today i see it's going to be green it's going to be green <laughs> we'll look forward to a green, green close in the first trading day in april thank let, you so let much me just, let me just add one more thing what i've re realized that this is uh, well, for the first time, right, um, well, probably because the week is just starting for April. The month of April, right, For the from historical, uh, from 2018 to 2023, I've always been on the red. So let's see how 2024 looks. looks look, I mean, if there will be a, uh, if you to close, then now it's early, it's too early, but from 2018 to 2022, the month of um sorry the month of um april. sorry sorry from the sorry is wrong um from april the period of april has always been bullish from 2020 to date so let's see how if there will be a continuation of that trend okay we'll watch out for that trend thank you so much abdul rashid okay. momo okay. crw stock brokers for sharing your insights on business incorporated Thank you very much. So we'll move to the Middle East where most major equities, the Gulf traded mixed at intraday. Abu Dhabi was up 0.01%. We see Dubai also in green territory, 0.04%. And that was lifted by 1.1% rise in blue chip de developer Emma Properties and a 0.5% gain in Dubai Islamic Bank. Now, still within the region, we see Saudi and Qatar indexes trading in negative territory at intraday, 0.1% down, Qatar 0.35%. Now let's zoom in on the U.S. stocks and see how the futures performed in the early trade today. They slipped very much in the red. S&P 500, we see that down 0.17%. Dow Jones Industrial Average 0.33% down. Kicking off April with declines. This is what we're seeing now. NASDAQ 0.22% down. And then the futures, as I mentioned, that tied to the Dow Jones is down 0.33%. Uh, we're moving on. We're seeing other stocks that are performing well. Yesterday, they declined. We're hoping that the, 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 the stocks are going to rebound today after probably the news that they're waiting for. Um, the months um, by Friday, they're going to be waiting for the big payrolls data that's coming in. Investors are watching out for that. Now let's slip to the Asia market and see how they perform. Japan's the K225 rebounded. It was down yesterday on Monday in Monday's trade. Now rebounded by 0.09 percent, back to 39 point. 39,000 level. The cost in South Korea is up 0.19%. And the Hang Seng in China is up 
2.36%. That's the outlier in that region. Now let's look at the other stocks in that region. Shanghai in China is down, however, 0.08%. And the ASX in Australia is down 0.11%. In so we're just going to be looking at and watching out for the stocks that's been, you know, up and down for most of these uh, indexes, especially for Japan. I'm keeping my eye out for that. But I have so much hopes for that country and that index. I wanted actually. to ask, do you have an investment? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just, you know, I'm kind of bullish on them and they've okay. been doing really well. So especially with starting the year off on a negative note and, you know, coming out and outperforming, we're going to be watching out and see how they're All right, the year. we'll join you and watch out. <laughs> Thank you, Will. All right, let's head to London now, where um, about 650,000 pensioners will be paying income tax for the very first time this year. I wonder why, but Juliana has the details. Hi, Juliana. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, in a, yes, you're absolutely right. In fact, I think a lot of our viewers will be quite shocked to hear that about 8.5 million people across the UK who are pensioners already pay income tax. And that's because, of course, we know that um, as you get older, most people get quite wise with their spending. So a lot of pensioners in this country, even though they don't work, they do get some form of income, whether it's on a second property or if they're doing uh, some part-time work. But the issue now is that there are going to be 650 thousand additional pensioners now paying income tax. And this is because of the Chancellor. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt, a couple of weeks ago in his spring budget, decided to freeze income tax um, at the threshold of about £12,000, which is fine. That was considered a tax cut a couple of weeks ago. But because of a sky high inflation that's riddled this country over the past couple of months, he also decided within that budget um, that pensions would rise by 8.5%. Um, so if you don't get a pension from a previous employer, then the British government, or shall I say the taxpayer, because it's our money, right? They look after pensioners um, by giving them about £11,000 a year. But because that's now been risen by 8.5%, it means that it just falls short of the frozen income tax allowance. So anybody who earns anything from, be it a second home or a mortgage abroad, or they've got stocks and shares anywhere, if you get that money and it's above £1,000 a year, then of course you're now going to be eligible to pay income tax because it's just above that threshold. So the good thing about this story is, of course, we know that pensioners, you should be looking after the elderly. So it's great that the government have hiked the pension rate. The only thing is there are some concerns uh, by some charities in this country that perhaps, you know, if you're not looking at your letters or you're not clear, um, then perhaps you could actually miss the fact that you need to pay tax. We know tax is quite complex and complicated. Um, but yeah, I think the reason why this story has been announced is because they want anybody who's watching, anybody above 60, 65, if you're getting state pension, do check to make sure that your income doesn't exceed uh, the threshold for not paying income tax. Yeah, well, more work for the elderly uh, in most cases here. But looking at the house mm. prices, uh, I know you normally balance this. We see house prices falling, uh, but please tell us who is gaining, who is losing at this time? It's a good question, Inny, and it's not really clear because the house market has been sideways, um, obviously because of the pandemic, and then we had trustonomics, and then last summer uh, we had um, housing rates peak um, at about 6.6%. They've since come down from that peak, but because it is still costing quite a lot to borrow in this country, um, observers within the market nationwide, it's their data that was released this morning, uh, they have seen that actually price growth is now subdued. It's um, fallen month on month between February and March, I believe by about 0.2%. And again, um, lots of people that are observing the housing market are saying this is really just because of interest rates and it's a blip that if you look further into the year, they do believe that perhaps um, house prices will start to peak. It is still incredibly expensive to buy property in this country. You're looking at about 261000 for an average price, which 
according to black market calculations, I think that's about 420 million naira, absolutely phenomenal. And of course, as I always say, if you want to live in the capital, you're going to have to double your money. Um, but yes, um, it does appear that perhaps, um, you know, house prices will rise again. And when they do rise, of course, that's not great uh, for first time buyers who are already struggling to get on the housing ladder. I think there have been some um, bright sparks for them. I think there was one... Um, property uh, loaner that was saying that they were going to offer a 5% um, deposit, which is rare in this country. So you'd, you could put down a 5% deposit, but putting down a 5% deposit on £250,000 is still quite a lot of money. Uh, but as I said, this, uh, according to the experts, this is a blip and house prices will be back up and running. But of course, looking at the price of property is always a good indicator of how uh, the UK economy is sparing at the moment. Yeah, I knew it. I knew you would uh, give us the two sides of it because, I mean, sometimes these stories just come on the surface and they seem like good news. But when you look deeper, you know, then you know this is not so uh, good. But let's head to the markets right, now and see how that's doing at intraday. Yeah, of course, uh, Tuesday, short week this week because of the bank holiday, Easter Monday, yesterday. And the FTSE All Show is actually in tip-top shape. Uh, green is the colour of the FTSE. A lot of that has got to do with data we received this morning from the British Retail Consortium showing that UK food price inflation has fallen to its lowest level in about two years. That is a really big story here. And that is because, of course, we know it's two of the biggest indicators for high inflation in this country was one, the energy price. And we know the energy price cap has kicked in today. So bills are going to be about £250 lower. And the other thing that was hiking up inflation was food prices. And they have remained stubbornly high, but they've finally come down to a two-year low. And economists say this is the biggest indicator that we needed for the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee to start lowering uh, those interest rates. They did say last week that they are poised and ready to do so. So hopefully that may be coming sometime soon. So that's been reflected in the markets. At intraday, the all-share is up. It's up by 0.29%. The FTSE 100 is up by 0.40%. Uh, the FTSE 250, the domestic market, that's down at intraday any by 0.30%. In the currencies market, the British pound is currently trading up against the US dollar by 0.19%, up two against the euro by 0.16%. And the rally continues against the Japanese yen. The British pound is up by 0.24% against that uh, currency at intraday. All right, Juliana, thank you so much for that. So from London, we head to Europe where, well, it's big news now from yesterday that cannabis has been legalized in Germany, not just for medicinal purposes, but also for recreational use. I wonder how that will affect the market, perhaps to have its own market and all of that. But let's have Lars help us paint a closer or clearer picture. Hi, Lars. Good afternoon. So tell us more about this. Thanks for having me, Ini. Uh, funny you should ask that. As a matter of fact, there was a thick cloud of smoke over at least parts of the city. More than a thousand people actually met at Berlin's famous Brandenburg Gate to light up together and celebrate the new law, celebrate the fact that they can finally light up perfectly legal. That is what it's really all about. Cannabis is out of the criminal corner. One big sign there last night read, we don't want to be seen as criminals. Well, now people who are smoking weed are no longer seen as criminals. For a few years now already, Germans have already been uh, legally using weed for medicinal purposes, uh, like for pain relief, uh, for cancer patients, as an example. But of course, lots of people got fake prescriptions from their doctors just to get their hands on some buds. Now, uh, Germans over 18 years of age can legally grow up to three plants. They can buy weed. They can transport up to 25 grams of it. And they're pretty happy about it. Yeah, I can just imagine the smoke, as you said. But how are companies, you know, are reacting to this? 
Well, from the government's point of view, the consequences of legalizing cannabis are pretty good for sure. On the one side, by decriminalizing the drug, the government will indeed save millions that it used to pour into police and courts who had to deal with people smoking a joint somewhere. At the same time, the legal sale of cannabis product is, of course, very good business and it will bring in taxes. It's hard to say at this point what kind of revenue will be taxed and how much this will bring in. It could be up to 3 billion euros per year, that is according to some estimates, if Germany would completely deregulate the market. But that is not yet happening, so it will probably be a lot less, but it will still be several millions for sure. Also, there'll be, uh, there'll be a lot of companies doing great business now, not so much stores, but mostly those with products catering to hobby gardeners who want to cultivate their own plants. Legalizing cannabis will give that sector a tremendous boost. And I wonder if some of those companies will be listing at the equities markets. Well, with Easter behind us, uh, so is the first quarter of the year. And it was a good quarter for stock exchanges. The DAX here in Germany ended at just above 18,500 points. And the question is, of course, now can the index hold on to that lofty level? After lots of interest rate policy guessing, it looks like it's time for some real numbers now. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll have earnings season. And that can bring valuations down if companies' results are not quite as strong as investors' expectations might have been. We've uh, just seen that yesterday in the U.S. when uh, Donald Trump's media company that runs his weird uh, Truth Social app uh, dropped 20% after its performance came out a lot worse than some people had been expecting. Now, that's an extreme example, of course, but it can remind us that it's not all about interest rates here either, although some Fed speakers, of course, are lined up for this week as well. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Lars, for that. And I mean, interesting story of the cannabis, of course, legalized in Germany is still on, uh, making a buzz there. Well, we'll cut to Africa now. Yesterday, we did bring you the story of Kenya's inflation dropping and the lowest in, I think, in about three months. A good one for them. But let's find out the drivers of that, see if uh, this is just happening or it can be sustained. So joining us uh, to discuss this is a journalist with The Standard. The Standard is in Nairobi, the capital of Kenya, uh, and that is Ferdinand Nwongela. Uh, Ferdinand, good afternoon. So what drove this drop in inflation in the country? Because, I mean, a lot of African countries would like to get tips from that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the inflation drop in Kenya has been an interesting subject for journalists for the last uh, two months because uh, it, it's, uh, the shilling strength of, I think, 19% in the last quarter alone. That is after dropping continuously uh, since 2020. In 2020, uh, the Kenya shilling was, uh, was trading at around 100 shillings to the dollar. By January 2024, that was at 161 to the dollar. And then in, in less than a month, that dropped from 161 to about, uh, over the weekends, about 131, according to the Kenya Central Bank. So uh, several things have been attributed to this drop. The first thing, and the, I think the biggest that the government has said itself was that, uh, was the euro bond buyback. I think if you follow the Kenya story, we've had uh, quite a few euro, bond, uh, uh, euro bonds uh, trading. And one payment was coming due in February, I think uh, around 1.5 to 2 billion shillings. And there were fears that uh, Kenya would not be able to make that uh, payment, which was, of course, would have meant a default. And a default is a scary thing for investors. Uh, so in February, uh, Kenya did manage to honor the deal for the two, uh, I think, two billion uh, dollars uh, euro bond buyback, and that strengthened investor confidence. And the government itself has credited this drop uh, to, the, to, to the to the euro bond uh, deal. Because six months prior, I think from August to January uh, 2024, August 2024, there were a lot of fears. And I think this was when we saw the biggest drop in Kenya shilling. Uh, you remember that Kenya is a net importer, which means our importers were struggling for dollars a lot. In, in December and January uh, 2024, just before the, the shilling started strengthening, we had a lot of uh, challenges with, 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 with imports. We had a lot of challenges with the dollar uh, circulation in the local market. We, there were reports of uh, uh, importers and banks holding uh, dollars. 
And one of the things that uh, I'm speaking about, what the government said is that the euro bond money uh, brought more investor confidence and dollars into the market. Of course, there have been uh, separate reports, uh, part, of, part of those reports being that maybe the government poured dollars into the market. But that is so far not the official official report from the government. But uh, what we can uh, authoritatively report is that in the last two months, uh, the Kenyan shilling strengthened by nearly 20%. And of course, these are the, the, the ripple effect on uh, consumer goods. We have seen uh, inflation drop, uh, I think, by twice in the last two months, from 6.9% in January to uh, March, I think, close around 57 uh, 5.7 is still higher uh, than than recommended, but uh, the government says they are working hard to still bring the inflation rates lower. What yes. we've seen is that uh, due to this, uh, the prices of goods have come dropping. And of course, uh, uh, for us, unga flour, or we call it flour, we call it unga here, uh, is an important component of our meals, and that's one of the things we've seen uh, prices dropping. The other one is sugar. Of course, all this is attributed to the fact that now our importers have, have access to more dollars, and that there is... Uh, the ability to bring more goods into the country. Of course, this has also seen uh, the price of petroleum products. I'm not sure how, how it is in Nigeria, but uh, <laughs> Kenyan uh, petroleum products have been on a rise, again, going up by nearly 70 Kenya shillings in less than six months. But uh, for the first time, uh, I think in the last uh, three months, this is, there has been a drop. And we expect, uh, if the government goes uh, by its promises, that this drop will keep, we, 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 the, the Kenyan shilling will continue strengthening. Actually, uh, one of the things I think it's important to note is that the drop in February was 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 touted to be the strongest, I think, since in nearly 20 years uh, for the Kenyan shilling. And one of the things that's done is uh, it has moved the Kenyan shilling from being one of the worst performing uh, currencies in the world, I think, to one of the better, better, uh, I'm not saying the best, but the better performing currencies. Mm -hmm, yeah. We are waiting to see if that uh, uh, drop will be sustained, but right now the government is promising that it will be. All right, uh, Ferdinand. Uh, I, I, I mean, you asked about how we're doing when it comes to the petroleum products in Nigeria. Uh, well, I guess I'll not answer. I'll just say congratulations to, to you guys there in Kenya. I mean, having the shilling gaining and, of course, having a drop in inflation and you were testing to the fact that it's actually reflecting in the price of basic commodities, especially food items. I can say congratulations uh, to thank Kenya you. on that. Well, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Thank you very much. All right, now, uh, still in Kenya now, the government will allow private firms that enter the electricity distribution market to import power from neighboring countries, putting pressure on power producers to cut wholesale tariffs. And these are among the proposals by the Energy and Petroleum Regulator Authority to open the electricity distribution sector, uh, which to spark competition with Kenya power and boost service delivery to consumers, widening options for the power distributors and is likely to trigger increased competition on the wholesale tariffs, ultimately leading to cuts in costs. In Egypt, the International Monetary Fund uh, will tie payments to Egypt on the, that $8 billion that they just got uh, Friday after financial program to Cairo's letting market conditions determine the price of its currency and in uh, making foreign exchange available to businesses as well as private individuals. Now, Egypt, which signed a loan agreement on March the 6th, will have immediate access to $820 million this week, then another $820 million after review to be completed by the end of June. Subsequent reviews will be made every six months with each unlocking payment of $1.3 billion provided certain conditions are met with the last payment in autumn of 2026. And uh, this was, of course, disclosed by the mission chief that visited Kenya. The International Monetary Fund's executive board approved the program on Friday, expanding on a $3 billion extended fund facility that was signed in December 2022. In South Africa, the, uh, the country recorded smaller foreign direct investment inflows of 16.2 billion rand in the fourth quarter of 2023 from 26 billion rand in the third quarter. And this is according to the central bank data. For 2023 as a whole, the FDI fell 
to 96.5 billion rand from 151 billion rand in 2022 as equity investment by foreign parent companies in domestic companies slowed. The South African Reserve Bank quarterly uh, bulletin is where we have this information. Economic activity in the country remains stagnant in the fourth quarter as real gross domestic product as the GDP expanded by only 0.1% following a contraction of 0.2% in the third quarter of that year. On an annual basis, GDP slowed significantly from 1.9% in 2022 to 0.6% in 2023. And uh, the government of the state of Qatar and the government of the Republic of Uganda have signed an agreement uh, to enhance joint cooperation in the fields of labor and organization of labor recruitment from the Republic of Uganda. The agreement was signed on behalf of Qatar by the Minister of Labor, Dr. Ali bin Shama al-Mari, and on behalf of Uganda by the Minister of Gender, Labor and Social Development, Betty Amongi. The agreement aims to enhance the strategy of the Ministry of Labor in attracting skilled and qualified labor, bolstering their presence in the local market and improving the productivity of the private sector, as well as upgrading the work environment. Under the agreement, the two parties will facilitate the procedures for recruiting skilled labor from Uganda and supply the local market with required competences and qualifications. Let's head to the crypto space now and see what the numbers look like this afternoon, um, beginning with the headlines uh, of what's going on in the crypto space. Well, I know one headline is that Bitcoin price today. Uh, mining companies have increased their BTC holdings for Bitcoin. And I guess that's uh, uh, talking about the long-standing positions and all of that. Uh, it's being liquidated and all of that. That's the first one. Uh, we see the movement. We see the movement of the price. Uh, the main force behind today's drop is related to liquidations in long positions. So before the drop, uh, BTC's open interest weighed funding rate was unusually high. Another top top topic is the theta. Uh, theta surpasses. $5 billion Bitcoin holdings milestone. And uh, this recent surge in this stablecoin accumulation by large wallets over the past three weeks has sparked significant interest and speculation within the market, as highlighted uh, the, um, that wallets holding at least $5 million in crypto collectively, 5.09% of the combined supplies. And finally, Ethereum. Ethereum is at the risk of dropping below 3,000. How real is this risk? We have Sheon uh, to help us. Okay, hi Sheon, good afternoon. So we see uh, a story that Ethereum is at the risk of dropping below 3,000. That's scary because we've seen Ethereum uh, just about two weeks ago hitting 4,000. 4, What's behind this risk? I mean, uh, typically if Bitcoin takes a uh, hit, other coins will follow suit. So since we've seen a lot of liquidations around Bitcoin, Ethereum being the second largest uh, cryptocurrency by market cap definitely would also have significant hits. And let's not forget that a lot of people see more potential in Ethereum for growth than Bitcoin at the moment. So most people think, well, since Bitcoin is close to 70,000 and Ethereum is just um, slightly under 4,000, it's easier for them to acquire more Ethereum even though the fundamentals are completely different, I must say. But people feel if they, there are most, more chances of um, Ethereum doing maybe 5x, five times what its current price is, and Bitcoin doing that. Mm. So a lot of people go to Ethereum. And um, because of the halving coming up, there's been increased sentiment and increased greed. Let me put it that way. So a lot of people have been going and longing Bitcoin, you know, so that basically they've been trading futures. And that means everybody is betting that Bitcoin is going to surpass a certain level. And then, of course, as people trade Bitcoin, they also trade the other altcoins for higher returns. And it's just fundamental for the market. The market always needs to set everybody correctly. And there will be some retracement. People will need to take profits. And, you know, we all will look forward to the rallying just before or after the halving. Very briefly now, Sheon, because we are, we are already out of time. So I guess investors should not just be looking, talking about the halving now, be looking at Bitcoin, but the alt might also be having or holding some potentials for them. Oh, definitely, definitely. So the alt always 
rally a lot more than Bitcoin over the past couple of years. Even though Bitcoin is, you know, the safest or the most popular of the cryptocurrencies, what we've seen over the years is um, whenever there's a halving or whether there's any significant um, events or even just traditional bull markets, we see that a lot of all the altcoins, I mean, the ones with good fundamentals, even some meme coins like Dogecoin and the rest of them, actually, Shiba, you know, and the likes, we've also seen them actually, you know, rally. Right? So people place their bets, you know, on those on those particular uh, tokens. And yeah, the altcoin, the altcoin market, immediately after the Bitcoin um, rally, the altcoins always take over. All but right. this year might be significantly different. But wow, time will that- tell. That sounds scary. Unfortunately, we don't have time to delve into that. But thank you so much, uh, Sean Daniel, for your time this afternoon. Thank you very much for having me. All right, so that's it. Uh, well, uh, closing on the crypto space and uh, hearing what Sean has said, perhaps, if you are an investor, they want to take a closer look at your investment at this time. But that's the much we can take on Business Incorporated today. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Remember, you can always watch Business Morning Business Incorporated on our YouTube channel. But I'll be back tomorrow, God's grace, and we'll have a fresh episode all over again. I'm Ini John McQuay. Enjoy the rest of your day.